I would like to welcome you all here at the European University Institute and particularly at the Migration Policy Center. Uh, I would like to welcome especially uh, colleagues and friends because I think I know everyone in this room and it's always a great pleasure to meet friends uh, in these sort of occasions. I know uh, that travel was not uh, smooth for everyone. Some of you had difficulties to cross the Atlantic or to cross the Mediterranean or even to cross continental Europe, but eventually you are all here. So thank you very much. I'm extremely grateful to all of you for attending that uh, opening conference of the Migration Policy. Center. The Migration Policy Center will be officially uh, uh, inaugurated uh, this afternoon, but let me just tell you now that it was a long story. It took years to have it eventually born today, and uh, this center is building on what we did uh, here at the EUI, building observatories of migration first in the southern neighborhood of the European Union, then in the eastern neighborhood of the European Union, then in India, then developing a number of programs uh, in collaboration with uh, universities and centers all around the world. All that took something like eight years. Uh, we now have a real center. We have a number of publications in uh, the USB uh, uh, drive, in the USB stick that is in your package. You will discover our publication, something like 500 research reports on migration. Um, we have a, a, a well-established um, website receiving on average 1,000 visitors a day, so everything is working well. In addition to opening today the Migration Policy Center, we have today the first day of a more traditional but extremely enjoyable uh, event, which is the summer school, the Migration Summer School. It is our eighth uh, summer school now, starting on the topic of migration and development, and uh, that summer school started in 2005. We are going to have debates on migration, and uh, uh, well, let me just uh, tell you, let, let me just start with a few words on what we do at the Migration Policy Center. International migration is clearly the result of inequalities between nations, inequalities uh, between their peoples, and in the last decades, global divides, let us say schematically between developing and developed uh, countries, <coughs> have been widening in absolute terms, in terms of access to economic resources, in terms also perhaps of access to political resources. And this is a very strong reason why uh, people are on the move. The reasons for people to migrate have been increasing in recent years. But the global divide also at the same time has been narrowing. It has been narrowing with regard to education, with regard to knowledge, with regard to capabilities which means that migration has become increasingly feasible. So migration on one side increasingly uh, desired by people, on the other side increasingly feasible, and all that in the context of communications that are increasingly easy, cheap, and global. And we would expect that international migration is booming. And actually, uh, if we look at uh, data, and I'm speaking under the control of people who know more than me about data, uh, recently international migration has been on the rise. Perhaps it has been also slackening over the last two years, we don't know really, but perhaps as a result of the economic downturns. 
we are talking of something like millions or perhaps tens of millions uh, new international migrants every year. But this is a very small number. This is very little compared with cross-border mobility of people. Cross-border mobility of people is just soaring. We are talking not of millions, but probably in the billion people every year. Of course, most of these people will return within a day uh, to their point of departure, and they are not migrants. But many will stay longer. They will stay longer. Are they migra migrants or not? It will depend upon how long they stay. And currently, we consider that you have to stay, or your intention should be to stay more than one year. But actually, if we decided that it is no, not one year, but three months, or two months, or six months, the number of international migrants would be much, much, much bigger than what it is. Uh, nevertheless, I think that it is not as big as it would be if the determinants of mobility, of human mobility, were uh, playing freely. For example, recent surveys among Arab youth have shown that just a majority of the young people in Arab countries today are dreaming or are desiring or even have the intention to have a migratory experience in their lives. So the real question is not why do we have so many migrants, but of course, why do we have so few migrants? A number of reasons uh, have been um, offered to that question and to start with one's attachment to the home. But clearly, there is a predominant reason, which is that nation states are reluctant today. They are reluctant not to let their own citizens go, because currently nation states are uh, extending citizenry to their emigres, to their citizens abroad. But they are reluctant to admit newcomers, to admit them and to include them in the citizenry. National identities, whether imagined or uh, claimed identities of other world, are the strongest limitation to international mobility and to international migration. The crisis that has hit uh, the economies of the developed world, and in particular of the EU, has just increased that reluctance of states to uh, admit uh, newcomers. With unemployment now at two digits in many countries of the European Union, with just twice that level of unemployment among migrants and even among their sons and daughters, there is a clear and strong policy tension in all the uh, uh, states of the European Union and probably beyond between on one side policies on immigration that would be policies to manage new flows of migrants, of migration, and policies of integration, uh, meaning policies to accommodate old flows of migrants. Uh, there is another big tension today in our countries, in the European Union, between, on one side, circumstantial uh, challenges that are linked to the crisis and structural forces. Between, on one side, immediate concerns of governments which are to protecting their citizens, responding to anxious public opinions, and with this regard, migration is often not suitable. And on the other side, long-term factors such as demographic trends and perhaps tomorrow climate change or innovation and progress for which migration is desirable and very often needed. That tension translates 
into contrasted, extremely contrasted stances between, on one side, politicians or polities for which, for whom now international migration is predominantly like a scarecrow. And on the other side, the academia, <coughs> academicians, for which, for whom international migration is perhaps a problem, but is perhaps also part of the solution to the problem. And uh, there is a risk today, I think, of growing mutual unwillingness to understand between politicians and academicians. And I think, as a scholar, that we must listen to the arguments of politicians. We must bring them convincing evidence in order to have an impact on policy making. Otherwise, we are just going to fail. In Europe, in the European Union, <clears throat> that matter is extremely complicated by uh, the, the nature of Europe. Why? Because we currently have different views between, on one side, the European Union, and on the other side, its member states. On one side, the European Union that agrees, uh, no, both agree, I would say, to combat irregular migration but they differ on all the rest, on all the rest, which is economic migration, which is family reunification, which is asylum. On all these issues, uh, to be very schematic, uh, the, the, the tendency of the European Union is to promote mobility, uh, mobility under control, of course, but to promote mobility, <laughs> while the view of most member states is to contain mobility. All member states today in the European Union, whether they are large receivers of international migrants or small receivers of international migrants, are now, let me put it bluntly, massively anti-immigration. And that is absolutely new. And this is the context in which the Migration Policy Center opening today uh, has been created. Our launching event uh, over uh, the coming two days uh, will be dedicated to this issue. We are not going to present the results of our uh, many, many uh, research conducted over the last eight years. Instead, we are going to concentrate, and that was our option, to concentrate on burning issues of today of today and of tomorrow. And we are going to do that, you will see on the program, under the form of panels and debates. The difference between panels and debates is that panels correspond to some work that we have been already doing within uh, the framework of that newly created Migration Policy Center. Special programs that we have been launching over the last three or four months. While debates are uh, not our own uh, uh, production, if I may say so, but we invited scholars of high or extremely high uh, reputation to uh, bring their ideas to the Migration Policy Center. We are going to have two panels. The first one will be on immigration and EU labor uh, markets. And the question will be how to have uh, this passionate reflection on international labor migration in times of crisis. And we are going to deal with that uh, through four angles. The first one is a classical question about employment. Are migrants and natives competitors for the same jobs, or are they complementing on segmented labor markets? Question number two will be on innovation. Do migrants hamper or do they foster innovation that is needed in times of crisis? The third one uh, will be on welfare system. Are migrants a burden or an asset for welfare systems? 
Are they contributing more or are they benefiting more from the welfare systems of their host countries in Europe? And the last one will be on outsourcing of jobs and immigration. Does immigration offer an alternative to uh, outsourcing of jobs and a means to keep employment at home. The second debate will be on the Arab Spring and its consequences on migration. Social and political movements that are uh, observed all across uh, the Arab countries have raised enormous expectations in the concerned countries, but also at world level, that democracy would succeed to authoritarian regimes. They have also raised the fear that destabilization would trigger a real exodus of people, and in particular to the European Union. So we are going to examine this uh, question through a number of uh, case studies as well as through a reflection based on the latest statistics. Then we are going to have debates. The first debate will be on migration policies for economic recovery. The crisis in the European Union and in other parts of the world has resulted into mounting unemployment into probably, uh, even though this is not absolutely obvious everywhere, into decreasing immigration and in certain countries into growing emigration. And the question uh, will be, will migration play a role in overcoming the crisis? Question number one. And question number two, will post-crisis economies need migration the same way as pre-crisis economies, and, uh, or will it be different? Debate number two will be on framing ethnicity in migration statistics. Immigration becoming global brought enormous and unprecedented cultural diversity in many parts of the world, but in particular in the European Union. That is certainly an opportunity for enriching our cultures, but it is also uh, quite obviously a challenge. It is a challenge to receiving societies where the formation of migrant, of migrant communities uh, bear the risk of having uh, social cohesion uh, uh, challenged and also a challenge for migrants uh, themselves in particular with regard to the risk of being discriminated against. So in this uh, framework are statistics based on ethnicity susceptible to bring uh, the evidence ne needed by policymakers to combat discrimination and to favor good integration of, uh, of different cultures. Debate number three will be on migration trends in post-Western world. And uh, clearly, uh, let me uh, start by saying that by definition, migrants are mobile people. And the map of migration by definition is also a very unstable map. What will be the map tomorrow? Uh, that is an interesting question. Will the North or the West still be a magnet for global migrants or will they go elsewhere? Will there be a global competition for migrants? These are uh, extremely uh, important questions, in particular for policymakers today. And then we are going to move to another uh, burning, uh, extremely preoccupying issue, which is the topic of forced migration and the international community. If we look at statistics and we accept the last year, 2011, we will discover that the number of global asylum seekers and migrants and, and refugees, sorry, has continuously declined over the last uh, two decades. 
Is this good news? Does this mean that the world is becoming better? I'm not sure at all, because if we open another page of uh, the statistical yearbook of UNHCR, we will discover that while uh, numbers of refugees and asylum seekers are declining, numbers of IDPs, internally displaced persons, are booming, are soaring meaning that probably the decline in refugee trends is not good news, but bad news. It means that nations have, are becoming increasingly closed to uh, international refugees. And I'm talking about many nations, not about all of them, uh, as we are going to discover, uh, reaching uh, the Arab Spring uh, issue, many nations are open to refugees, but certainly not uh, European nations today. So these will be uh, our uh, burning issues for today. Um, I'm convinced that it will be a fascinating uh, conference. Uh, let me just repeat that you have in your package, you have this uh, USB stick containing all our publications plus the uh, program of these two days. So uh, I already uh, took too much of your time and now uh, let us open uh, the first debate, the first session, Georgia. Thank you. Thanks, Philippe. It's an honor for me to open the, to be the chair of the first session of the launch of the Migration Policy Center. And of course, as you already mentioned, the topic migration policy for economic recovery is a key issue. Everyone knows that one of the main consequences of the crisis has been an increase in unemployment in the European uh, countries and elsewhere, and especially of youth employment. And the tight situation in the European labour markets is affecting migration policies. Philippe mentioned whether the post-crisis economy, hoping that there will be a post-crisis economy, will still need migration, and whether this migration is going to be a different type of migration from the one we have had so far, or whether we will have the same type of migration. <coughs> But the issue of stakes are many, and they will be discussed, as you heard, today and tomorrow. Uh, skilled and unskilled migration. Is the EU able to attract skilled migrants? Has the blue card work to attract blue migrant, uh, skilled migrants? The relationship between migration and offshoring or outsourcing, are they complement or substitute? How can we frame a discussion about migration, trade, outsourcing? Are we able to do that or not? What kind of relationship this implies between new and old members of the European countries? Pension policies, this is an absolutely crucial issue which we have not even solved well across European countries. And what about sending countries and European countries? Uh, tomorrow we will be enlarging the frame to something with a focus on the Mediterranean countries. This is even more relevant today after the result of the Egyptian election. We'll discuss about the role of refugees, the role of illegal migrants, and I think this is absolutely crucial. I don't want to take more time since I'm only the chair, and let me just introduce our speaker. My role will be mainly the one of coordinating the debate and be very tough to the speakers if they speak too much to introduce the debate. Uh, there is something that you don't have on the program, which we will have some specific data, some data shown by Ashley McCormick, which is a researcher of the Migration Policy Center. We'll start with a five minutes presentation on data, and then we have our two main speakers of the panel, the debate today, uh, which are um, Dimitri Papademitriou and Klaus Zimmermann. Let me say a few words about Dimitri Papademitriou. Uh, he, you probably all know him, he's a very famous. He's a co-founder and president of the Migration Policy Institute in Washington. Uh, but he has had many, many um, positions in, uh, related to the migration, to trade and migration in all of his life. He's also the co-founder international chair of Metropolis. He has served as the chair of the World Economic Forum Agenda Council on Migration. He's the chair of Migration Committee of the, of the OECD. 
basically, he has more than 250 books, articles, monographs, research reports on migration topics, and he advised almost everyone, I suppose, which has dealt with migration. That's why migration so. is doing so poorly. <laughs> well, I don't know. This shows that you have a large portfolio. You have diversified your risk. So uh, is, and then the second speaker today is going to be Klaus Zimmermann. Klaus has a PhD from the University of Mannheim, and he has had many academic and policy advising position as well. He has been, he's professor now at the University of Bonn, and he's director of the Institute of Study for Labor, the ISA in Bonn, which is a very, very important for study, not only of migration, but of labor market and other related issues. He's also the chief editor of the Journal of Population <coughs> economics, and again, he has billions of academic articles, books, research reports, and so on and so forth. I don't know whether you arrive up to 250, but maybe we can count them. And he has a very high impact index uh, also as citation and uh, things like that in all the world, not only related to migration, but also to population dynamics, labor economics, industrial organization, and somehow also econometrics. So let me not take more time and start with a giving the word to Ashley for his data presentation, on which I think we can base then the debate. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm doing a very simple, uh, yet I think telling analysis of the correlation or the understanding between unemployment and immigration in the 27 EU states between 2001 and 2012. Now, the analysis is split between two groups. There we go. Um, the analysis is split between two different groups. So if you look up at the screen, there's a white bar and a black bar. The white bar is prior to the recession. The black bar is post, well, during and post the recession. Um, the idea of correlation, for those who don't understand, is if, if, my, if immigration rises as unemployment rises, they're positively correlated. In this case, it's the opposite. There's a dominant negative trend for all of these countries, including the likes of Germany and Italy. Um, so prior to the recession, there was, a strong, there was a strong relationship between immigration and unemployment, namely that if unemployment rises, immigration lowers. That should be fairly obvious for all of those white bars. During the recession, on varying levels, they fell. So this, this correlation fell, therefore, um, immigration rose slightly as, uh, well, the correlation weakened anyway. Um, for the second group, there's fewer countries for, like Belgium, Sweden, including France. The relationship used to be positive, therefore, when unemployment rose, immigration rose. However, due to the recession, or after the recession anyway, this relationship reversed, and in the case of Austria, rather strongly. Um, the point is here is that the majority of EU states now have a negative correlation, a fairly strong negative correlation in my opinion, between unemployment and immigration. So immigration does not, well the relationship is fairly complicated but in this case immigration and unemployment there is not a positive relationship so migrants do not go to countries with high unemployment rates. However, there is a negative positive trend. So, if you look at the countries, it's rather important. So, Italy, uh, sorry, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain, the relationship, especially for Portugal and Spain, was rather strong in the negative correlation. However, this shifted, this has shifted into a very positive correlation. Um, hence, these are the countries which is quite widely published, could possibly be in trouble economy wise. Uh, this is just to give context to the debate. I'm sure we'll have some more advanced analysis now. Thank you, Ashley. I think this is a very nice way of putting some data to uh, the floor for the discussion because the issue of having a positive or negative correlation between unemployment and migration is absolutely crucial to discuss what kind of policies we can use. 
of course, the correlation affects the type of policies that countries are meant. And this also gives you an idea of the heterogeneity in European countries through the crisis on that. So I'll give the word now to Dimitri. Uh, I think you're going uh, to go Klaus. first. Right? Okay, sorry. So first to Klaus. Thank you very much, Georgia. Thank you very much uh, to Philip Farg and uh, to the Migration Policy Center of having me. I'm very happy to be here and to contribute to uh, this uh, important um, debate at this uh, stage. Um, uh, as we already have seen, um, uh, migration is often related to economic issues. Unemployment is uh, an issue. Inequality is another one. Um, the opinion uh, of policymakers and of the public is often that, uh, yeah, unemployment is caused by migrants, and migrants also create inequality. These are the two. Uh, opinions you can often hear. It doesn't matter where the country is and where the people are, but this is a general prejudice. We have seen that uh, already in these numbers, but the other numbers, and what is important is the long run in particular. Uh, we have, of course, OECD countries, a clear negative correlation between unemployment and um, the presence of migrants. Okay, we all know as uh, scientists, uh, it's not very clear what the cause and what the effect is, but uh, at least uh, this uh, inspection is, is very useful to know in a public debate. The other issue is that it's not true that people, uh, migrants are uh, uh, in, in countries more present where we have, uh, we have inequality. So migrants typically come, if you look at OECD countries, um, uh, come or uh, are present where there is more equality. It's also very clear to show in, in, in this economic analysis that high skilled migration uh, always leads, or mostly, mostly, most of the time, Time, theoretically and empirically, uh, to more equality. So migration, in such at least uh, in in the long run, is, uh, is 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 should not be so much uh, debated as it is. And the mystery is why it is. That that's a mystery. Now, uh, of course, everything can be different, and we already seen a little bit here in times of at crisis. Uh, that's at times of crisis. Uh, migration is even more important than in normal situations because uh, migra migration is one of the few strong flexibility reserves economies have uh, to adjust across the borders. So um, when we gave up the euro, hot discussion, when we gave up the euro, we gave up flexibility. And it was clear, and was part, I was part of that debate at that time, that we need more mobility in Europe to uh, um, take uh, the, the step uh, uh, flexible exchange rates had so far. But we also know after tons of advisory work for the Commission and many uh, also good initiatives from there uh, that we haven't come very far making Europe more flexible. Um, and this is certainly also part of the current uh, problem we have uh, in, with the Euro. Now, the issue here is uh, what can uh, we do in the context of uh, the crisis? Uh, migration policies for economic recovery, that's uh, the headline here. Now, we have 24 million uh, unemployed uh, across uh, Europe at the moment. Well, people ask, do we still mi need migration? Uh, also, um, uh, countries like Germany and other northern uh, European countries may think, well, the guest worker regime uh, from the 60s has left us with lots of bad feelings or memories. Uh, why do we need uh, this, this now? Also, uh, many politicians in key countries like the UK, Spain, Italy have, caused, have asked uh, critical questions. So the issue again is uh, now why do we need uh, migrants? Now, um, the migrants we need because they foster adjustments and uh, the crisis has created not only a large amount of unemployment across Europe, it has created interestingly 
recently a very big difference between unemployment across Europe. So this is kind of a key case to, to, to show how it could work and how it should work and maybe to understand why it doesn't work. Well, I'm coming from a country, Germany, which has, has, had, uh, has been lucky in the crisis. We had had a particular type of crisis affecting uh, export-oriented manufacturing industries with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with excess demand for workers, with high uh, labor holding uh, policies, with, with, with time accounts, and so on. So uh, we uh, had also seen large labor market reforms uh, in, uh, in the last decade. So we have been lucky, uh, but now we have very low unemployment rates. We desperately search workers. And the problem is, yeah, do people come? Well, there was a, a case study uh, done in, uh, um, in, 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 a, in a city called Schwäbisch Hall. This is a town in Swabian. Baden-Württemberg is, uh, is one of the, uh, the, the South European healthy economic states. And there they have, have 6,000 uh, free uh, slots uh, for workers. And the mayor there said, well, why not getting them from South Europe? And he invited uh, uh, journalists, and, uh, and, and, and there was a newspaper campaign, and 20,000 people from the South applied. Uh, well, until today, a few months later, uh, only a few people are, um, are employed. Uh, nobody has found a job. Uh, also, there are lots of, uh, lots of uh, places. Now, the Die Welt am Sonntag, this is one of the two major newspapers in Germany, wrote yesterday, Ja, wo bleibt ihr denn? Well, where are you now? We are waiting for you. So, what happens is, also we have a huge uh, uh, dispersion between unemployment rates, um, where there is a need. Uh, well, every, every day you can read the newspaper that Germany desperately needs workers. Skilled workers in particular, but skills can be defined in various ways, but they are not there. And the real question is actually, and this is what uh, Philip already said, the question is not why we have so many migrants, the question is why migration doesn't do the job we want it to do. Now, um, I probably have consumed most of my time for <laughs> already, but um, I would like to uh, now um, address a few of these issues Issues more more carefully. Now, uh, why is labor mobility so important? Uh, this is very difficult for an economist typically to explain uh, non-economists why we think that for a functioning um, uh, world uh, is um, uh, labor mobility is very important. But the most things economists talk about is that we need an optimal allocation of resources. That means where um, um, an input like labor or capital is relatively scarce, we should bring it to them. This is the idea. The, the, the scarce resources have to be at the right place. And this generates high output and, and welfare. And if we uh, recalculate, would recalculate optimal population, so to speak, around the world through migration, we would, could get, get a huge rise, much more than we straighten these days, a huge rise in, in welfare around the world. So that's one reason why we want that. So uh, we want to have the right resources at the right places where they are desperately needed. Now, um, in particular times of crises, uh, mobility, especially labor mobility, plays uh, a big role. Before you move uh, uh, whole uh, companies, you can better move people uh, um, uh, at the local level, but at also at the transnational level. Uh, well, then the other issue issue is we face demography anyway. Um, uh, after 2020, at least in Germany, it becomes very, very dark. Uh, dramatic changes uh, in the labor force. Other countries have the same uh, problem. Um, so there is uh, a decline in population and aging in population and a rapid increase in the demand for skilled workers. Uh, that cannot be, if you see it at the European level, satisfied by EU natives alone. Uh, 
uh, even if we would, uh, would, would reduce the mobility barriers. Um, well, we know that European natives are very immobile. There are good reasons. I will come to that for it. But uh, we may have to work on this more heavily. Labor migrants um, are typically more mobile than the native population. And ma labor migrants also do other jobs than natives typically want to do. And it's also true that more and more EU unskilled workers will remain unemployed unless more uh, non-EU skilled immigrants help generating jobs for them. So that's also one issue. Even if you have a lot, there's lots of unemployment, if you bring in people with new skills or with skills at all, uh, so to speak, they typically generate jobs for others for less skilled people. And um, that's why uh, the, the inflow of skilled workers never can be a problem. Um, that's my uh, maybe provocative um, position. So skilled migration is the absolute minimum we have to work on. Oops, this was the wrong direction, or what is this? this uh, yes, effects of the current economic uh, crisis. Uh, we um, uh, should know that uh, the biggest flexibility reserve we have mobilized after EU enlargement uh, by uh, getting a, a number of new member states. And workers from there uh, have moved substantially and they generate a new type of worker who is not only willing to come but also willing to move on. Uh, these are labor migrants who typically also would like to move back home eventually. Um, so um, that's something we have to, to see in particular what's happening now after the crisis uh, uh, or within the crisis with these new type of labor migrants. Uh, now, um, labor migrants typically are very responsive to economic cycles, especially if there are no mobility restrictions for returning. Um, that's a very important point. People are willing to leave if there are, um, um, uh, if there are no restrictions uh, for, for returning. Now, what uh, is hindering migration? Well, it's language still, family, knowledge about jobs, attitudes. These are the key, key issues. I mean, uh, the recent study um, by, the by, by the Commission has shown that uh, across Europe, language uh, is, is uh, other countries' languages is not well um, established in schools, and that certainly looks at an issue we have now. Uh, this all um, suggests that many foreign workers will now, or with a further worsening of the crisis, move home or to another destination countries. Now, uh, just to show you um, a little bit of a, also of a graph, um, uh, net migration flows in selected countries. Uh, the red line is, uh, is well, is Spain. Uh, from huge inflows, net inflows, it's going uh, to be negative uh, in last year. In Germany, uh, which was afraid about uh, immigration for many years, we had over uh, uh, 40 years in the average 700,000 people coming per year, 500 100,000 leaving, leaving a net uh, 200,000. We, we were an emigration country in the recent years, but now we have taken over again. Yes, last year we were nearly 300,000, so about 100,000 above, above uh, what um, we had seen uh, before. Now, um, here uh, uh, you see uh, 280,000 about we, we, we had net immigration. This was 20% more than 200, uh, 2010. Uh, the, the EU countries, uh, well, 34% more uh, from the EU countries. And among those countries uh, with, very, uh, with very strong increase in migration are countries like, uh, well, which were affected by the crisis, Greece plus 90%, 90%, 90%. Uh, Spain plus 52 percent. So, uh, so in a way, you could say, well, it works. Uh, but uh, well, the question is, it works only partially because most of these people are not yet seen really on the labour market. Um, that's um, that we also can say. Now, what are the consequences? Well, uh, certainly in the post-crisis world, 
uh, circular migration will become more and more important. Um, I think that the crisis will, will help uh, to understand that mobility is important, uh, to um, move out of countries of problems, to move into countries, to work slots where we uh, have challenges and, and possibilities. And uh, hopefully this will help establishing a tradition that um, work in uh, our century has to do with, uh, with local but also cross-country uh, flexibility from time to time. But however, this uh, has to be supported by uh, policies um, and um, uh, that's something we have to, to, to look at how we can organize that. And that's what I would like now to end with my talk, to talk a little bit about what we uh, should do to improve our possibilities to use uh, migration as uh, 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 flexibility for reserve for the economy. Now there's a short-term perspective. We certainly uh, have um, the advantage that we have the, still the new EU member states which are willing to, to contribute uh, to the labor uh, force. Um, uh, but also um, we have to use the economic crisis as an opportunity to establish uh, mechanisms um, politically within Europe to, to improve uh, flexibility. Um, well, um, when, more, when people would be mobile, why not now uh, attract people in apprenticeships? Let's say in, in Germany, people, uh, companies now coming to a phase where they no longer find young uh, uh, people for apprenticeship trainings. Why shouldn't we have more exchange uh, of schools? Why, we should, why shouldn't we foster more language uh, classes? And why do, don't we change more students than we already have, have done? Uh, these are maybe immediate uh, actions. Well, in the mutual uh, um, uh, term perspective, we have still lots of problems with recognition of professional qualifications. Uh, that's, uh, the, the German government has just started a new initiative, uh, which was in time uh, to, to, to do so, which is easy to do when, when you want it, but it was not there. And so we had a huge overqualification of migrants, let's say from the Far East uh, of Europe, lots of people come uh, to us, uh, for, for instance from the Ukraine, uh, highly uh, educated, but they are not working in the right uh, professions. Uh, uh, then the full and transparent portability of social entitlements is pension schemes and the like. Um, even job online uh, uh, platforms, exchange job exchange platforms, to, to know where which jobs uh, are available is a problem. But there's also an outcry in some countries if uh, uh, bureaucracy starts so. I remember when the German uh, labor office uh, uh, two years started uh, to recruit people from outside of uh, Germany, uh, there was a big outcry in the German newspapers that we sell out our jobs to, to other countries, and when the um, and when the minister uh, for economics was pushing for it, he was he got critical remarks. But this is the time where Europe has to stick together, and uh, um, neither should a country who sends workers uh, feel that there is a brain drain, nor should those receiving these workers consider that as uh, so to speak uh, as. as a selling of, of own precious uh, jobs for for its own uh, uh, young people. Uh, to the contrary, I mean, uh, we know that uh, from all uh, economics research that uh, guest workers or workers, so to speak, labor workers, uh, uh, workers who, who, who migrant, uh, uh, migrants uh, are coming and going, coming and going. Even, uh, as I, I, I remembered you about the 700,000 who came to Germany, these were not uh, in the average every year since the Second uh, World War in the average. 500,000 left and these were mostly not labor workers. If they would be labor, laborers, it would be maybe even more dramatic. Um, so there is a coming and, and going. So also we need more Europeanization of education policy programs and a strong promotion of ethical, edu educational exchange programs. Now finally, um, 
Uh, uh, um, this is, uh, yeah, my first, my, I have two more slides, this one and the next one. Um, the long term perspective, the problem is that uh, Europe is it globally seen not the first choice for migration. Yes, we will not uh, need, we will need, however, also uh, migration from other parts of the world. Uh, otherwise, we will just lose our people to other parts of the world. We have to also be open for uh, migration globally. That's why Europe has to um, implement an active immigration policy, relying on point systems for permanent migrants, maybe with the option of getting citizenships at the time. Uh, we need uh, temporary hiring procedures, uh, perhaps the auction system, which is uh, controversial. Uh, we need to attract uh, foreign students. Uh, this is where the hottest uh, competition will take place in the next decades. The Chinese have, in their new uh, five-year plan announced that they would like to be, be as a world market leader for human capital in the year 2050. Uh, yes. So what they do is they heavily invest uh, in, in students, uh, in foreign students, uh, attracting them to China and on sending Chinese students around the world. So that is um, a, a challenge which uh, they also in, Nor in, in Norway you find them as in, in, in Germany so, or in Canada. Uh, so um, that is um, a challenge which we have to, to take. And I think what we have to do is uh, to start negotiating, not about uh, the blue card uh, or whatever the card is colored, uh, uh, but for a special passport uh, that um, uh, would enable skilled laborers to work around the world wherever they find a job. So the field of the labor market, I think, should be coming. The, that's my, my, what I would like to to, to request um, to, uh, that this, this filter should, should, should help us to select workers. Now, I finish with a few last uh, remarks uh, on basic lessons for migration. Um, well, uh, the best migra economic migration is linked to the labor market as, as, as a filter. When you have a job, you, have to, you can come, and you have no job. After a while, you, you have to leave. That would be a controversial point but that's what, what I would like to suggest. The right or chance uh, for, for return to the host country uh, induces out migration. It's very important to, re to, re to realize from, from research. If you, if you have the right to return, uh, people are leaving. If they are not, uh, the histor history has shown that in Mexico and Germany and in other, in, in other countries uh, of the world. So the best thing is to give everybody a passport. Yes, so then people leave. Uh, the likelihood to return home home is, is, is higher when you have a German passport to leave Germany than otherwise. Uh, well, skilled migration, as my next, next point, is the cornerstone for any successful migration system. Student migrants are the best labor migrants. We should uh, fight uh, from them. And also, we should not fight. We should, we should support ethnic networks effectively because they uh, connect people um, uh, to, to jobs in uh, receiving countries, uh, but they also organize uh, the transfer of knowledge and resources uh, back home. And uh, that's uh, my, my picture of the world, a more open world, a more ethnically diverse world, uh, but I, uh, a world which is much more connected. Thanks. Thank you very much, Klaus. Basically, before giving the word to Dimitri, what I want to say is that Klaus highlighted some very important keywords in the debate. The first one is the issue of flexibility. And uh, this, obviously, it's uh, very, very important. And he mentioned the information, and he saw how Germany solved the information with the advertising on the Develt. Basically, there are other issues involved, which is the search cost, which is the languages. He sort of mentioned we should need uh, uh, study more languages. Maybe we should all start a study German, after all, if Germany is the only country in Europe which has an uh, increasing <laughs> search <laughs> today. Yeah, but we are always behind. Uh, now, of course, flexibility brings with it some uh, needs and institutional framework. 
because without a clear institutional framework we may have some trouble. One of the issues will be discussed tomorrow with the transfer, uh, transportability of pension with the Italian ministers and that's a very crucial issue but there are other. The second key word that he brought about is circular migration and I think we, this will be debated also later. The third, which is very important, is the European migration agenda. Now here, he sort of suggested a link. He did the short, medium, and long term, and that's a very important, and we are most interested in the long term, because that's what makes a change. And one thing that I think is very important links to one of the most successful European programs so far, which has been the Erasmus program for mobility of students. He mentioned that the student migrants are the best labor migrants, but the Erasmus is a cornerstone, I think, and could be a best practice that could be used. And finally, the uh, last keyword, which I think is crucial, which is here on the slide, is the ethnic networks. Uh, the, the networks are absolutely crucial. Here he speaks about migration, but uh, remember that networks of migrants also enhance trade and are very important for foreign direct investment. So this enlarged the frame. While we look at network of migrants, we are looking at the whole set of economics. Now, uh, let me give the word to Dimitri for his presentation. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Klaus. Um, let me start by congratulating Philippe uh, for um, the establishment of the center. And of course, establishing anything is not a single person affair, so the congratulations go to Philippe and the entire team at the center. And I am pleased to be here. Um, as we were walking here, you know, Klaus said, we got to find something to disagree on. <laughs> and it's up, to you now. it's up to me now, and I should never have ceded <laughs> the opening lecture to you. <laughs> but I will try to, if not disagree with Klaus, to look at Many of, the several, many of the same issues that Klaus has put on the table, but instead of looking at them from the five meter, 5,000 meter level of a macroeconomist who, for that matter, a macro thinker and a theoretician who can get away with saying in the long term we've got to, act to do X, Y, and Z, and instead I will look at the short and medium term I will look at the issue from ground level in order to paint a somewhat different, a perhaps a bit darker and pessimistic uh, picture about what is going on and what may happen in the next three to five years, hence the present and the, sh the short and the medium term. Because when you look at the issues from the short and the medium term, you know, you basically have things looking quite a bit different. And um, I know that all of us are implicated in a push toward openness, toward more immigration uh, through our writings, our lectures, our advice, etc., etc. But I think that people like us are equally responsible for advising people and writing um, uh, pieces that actually try to deal with the facts on the ground and try to deal with the immediate, the short, and the midterm. And when you look at the issues from that immediate and, and midterm, um, the picture gets at least quite a bit more opaque, unclear, at least to me. You don't have to buy into all of that. And the same way that um, the Klaus said that it is difficult to generalize, how can you possibly put Greece and Germany in the same sentence when it comes to present, middle, midterm, or for that matter, the future, I do want to caution all of us that what I will say sometimes will appear to be certainly inaccurate for certain parts of the European Union. And for those of you who may be looking for more federalism in Europe, and I heard you know, words about you know, European migration policy and all these other kinds of things, 
uh, which I will treat as neither here nor there, in other words, I won't touch upon, I will point out that it is very difficult to speak of the European Union as a single unit, just as it is very difficult to talk of the United States as a single unit. Alabama has nothing to do with, it, with New York. Arizona has nothing to do with California. And California has nothing to do with Illinois or New York. Entirely, entirely different systems, economic systems, migration systems, etc., etc. So something that may apply for the UK and Ireland may not apply for Southern Europe. Something that applies for Southern Europe certainly will not apply for the German-speaking Europe. Uh, and the Nordics are both part of the system and entirely outside of the system. So, with these cautions in mind, I will try to sort of start from a different point, which is what has happened in the last five years. And I think that instead of taking the long view of the past, taking the short view of the past is also important if you're going to try to sort of attempt to see into the future. Now, we all know that, you know, the crisis started sometime in 2007, 2008. And if you will allow me, I'll, I'll go beyond Europe, both to, to say some things about the United States, but also beyond Europe and say some things about the global economy and Asia in particular. Um, we saw in the first charts, the pre-Zimmerman um, charts, um, an indication that, you know, there are whatever it is, 25 million persons who are unemployed in the EU member states, and I beg to differ. Because if you're going to talk about unemployment, you have to talk about unemployment and underemployment. And as you all know, Eurostat now has started to look under the picture of unemployment the same way that the United States does. So comparing the 8.2% unemployment in the United States to the 10 point something percent unemployment in Europe is useless because both figures are wrong. The unemployment plus underemployment, and let me tell you what I mean, unemployment plus underemployment, I mean the people who are formerly un unemployed, that means they meet the rather strict definition of who is unemployed that is now common in Europe and the United States, someone who has looked actively for a job and is available for a job during the four weeks prior to the taking of the census of unemployed, and includes such people as discouraged people, people in other words who are unemployed and have given up because they know that they cannot find a job or they think that they can find a job, but they may have looked for a job the previous month or six months ago, and that's a significant number. And all of those people who are, quote, involuntarily unemployed, and this is a very, very, I'm sorry, involuntarily uh, part-time unemployed or employed, and that's a very large number. In 2000, the end of 2010, that complete figure was, according to the years, that 42.6 million people. And in the United States, the comparable number was 23 million people, making U.S. unemployment about 50, and underemployment about 15%. And you can do your own math as to what the 42 or 43 million dollar, 43 million unemployed and underemployed figure two years ago or a year and a half ago might be in percentage terms today. Why am I taking so much time to say that? Is because I want you to put, I want to put you or put us all in the mood of, oh my God, you know, things may indeed be worse than we thought that they are. And I needed to set the stage. I needed to be a bit different from where Klaus was. Now, these many million of people, um, not everybody has been hurt equally. In other, in other words, the job destruction and the job distress and economic distress has not affected all groups the same way. And again, I'm belaboring the obvious. 
but it is important sometimes that we actually do say the obvious. And I want to focus on one group of people in particular, the youth. Youth unemployment is remarkably high in most of our countries. When I say our countries, I am including the, the EU and the United States and all of the advanced industrial societies for that matter. There are exceptions. So I accept that. I don't think that 55% or 52%, which is the youth unemployment for Spain or Greece, is somehow the figure for everyone. But you find countries that are in the 30s and the 40s, and most other countries are in the 20s. Now, again, there are always two exceptions, those German-speaking words, Austria and Germany that are doing quite well. Youth unemployment are under 10% for both of these countries but I've already escaped from that problem by saying that everything I say does not apply equally to everyone. Um, and why am I worried about youth unemployment? And why do I think that we should all be terribly worried about youth unemployment? I will mention four reasons. I'm sure you can all come up with more than these four reasons. The first one is something that's well established by now. It's a long-term economic scarring. In other words, we now have evidence that from many places, from Sweden to Canada, the United States, Australia, and elsewhere, that people who do not get a job, do not get on a path to permanent employment when they graduate from college or you know, when they are young, have a very hard time having, becoming attached to the labor market on a, in a regular way, a hard time getting on pathways in jobs that have effective and long-term job ladders, opportunities in other words, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the second point is we may actually have the problem or at least risk losing an entire generation of workers. And this may, if it doesn't worry us, let me suggest as strongly as I can that it should. And of course the potential, the third reason, the potential for social disorder is obvious to everyone. After all, um, if you look at demonstrations, whether they are in, uh, in Egypt or the United States, I'm sorry, yeah, the United States or Italy or Greece or wherever, uh, you will see that the average age there is not our average age in this group. In this room, it's more like our average age minus 30. And finally, unemployed people who see no prospects and who are very young are more likely to find very much appeal in extreme ideologies. And I don't know if you worry about it, I worry about it. I said, of course, that this pain is, and distress is not uh, distributed equally across different uh, groups, and I mentioned young people, but men are also hurt. Men between 45 and 60 who tend to be a little less hurt tend to be hurt longer because employers, particularly in labor markets that are flexible, tend not to want to invest or re-employ people who have lost their job at that age group. So when people lose a job at that age, they tend to be unemployed much longer than people who lose jobs at a different time. And of course, minority groups. And again, I want to use immigrant and minority groups generally because you know, every society has a different experience with different immigrant and minority groups. So the ones that are doing particularly poorly in the UK are not the same ones that are doing poorly in the UK, I'm sorry, in Germany or in Greece where every immigrant group is doing very poorly for the obvious reasons. And what do these groups share in common? Because they do share things in common. Again, I'll state the obvious, but I need to make the case. Uh, their skills are low. They're difficult to recognize or to translate into the local economy. And their language skills are even poorer, which is, in a sense, a triple disadvantage in terms of skills. 
experience also tends to be different. They have less work experience and that of course puts them on the side when employers are looking to staff up again. They also tend disproportionately to concentrate in jobs that are often temporary, they are still in many declining industries and tend to be in sectors that expand and contract together or with the economic cycle. So you have, when you have a boom, they find a lot of jobs, whether it's catering, construction, you know, personal services, etc., etc. And when you have a bust, they are the first to go. And finally, employers really haven't invested in them in terms of training and other kinds of skills. So these people become more easily expendable. And again, this doesn't apply the same way to everyone in highly organized, highly unionized environments. You know, some of these things don't hold as much as they hold in places that have more flexible labor markets. And what does that mean? And here, I hope you will allow me to go global. We have seen it, we have Bella here and others, you know, who sort of look at the, at the gross numbers about international migration. And if I were to characterize, and I know that this is a bit of a caricature, um, south to north migration has mostly stalled. In other words, it hasn't been growing at the rate, anywhere near the rates that it had been growing until 2008. Despite the best efforts of some English-speaking countries uh, to continue or even grow in the case of Canada, uh, yes, let's say Canada and Australia and New Zealand grow their immigration flows. Uh, the sort of archetype of a stalling or a stalled migration is that between the United States and Mexico. Uh, you will recall that, you know, Mexican migration to the United States, illegal migration mostly, it was in the high five, six digits for most of the past 10 or 15 years, seven, eight hundred thousand uh, people per year in addition to a couple hundred thousand of legal immigrants. Now, the net migration between the United States and Mexico in the last couple of years is, let's say, zero. I'm not going to argue if you tell me it's 50 or if it is minus 50. And this is now fairly well established, you know, both from the census of Mexico from 2010, but also from those of us in the United States that look at this issue on a regular basis. The second broad result is that, of course, as already has been implied you know, by Klaus, and as we all know, is that south-to-south -south migration continues. And continues in a sense, you know, if you were to take the UN projections, it probably accounts for most of the growth of international migration. Where do these people go? Some of those people go really south to south, but if I were to change south to north to upper, upper income or high income countries, middle income countries, or low income countries, most of it is low to middle income countries. And by middle income countries, I mean countries that we don't really think about but have always been very large migration hubs, that's Southeast Asia, much of Southeast Asia, but increasingly so, the BRICS plus, with the plus of course being, you know, your Indonesia's and your Turkey's and your Mexico's. In other words, there is a, a churn in migration with directions going in many different places, which I think, regardless of what happens, in the fancy rich countries like our own will actually see most of the migration action happening there rather than here. Making our conversations, whether they are positive or negative about migration, a bit besides the point. I know we don't like to, to acknowledge this, but what the heck, you know, maybe we're not as relevant as we all think. Maybe the world does not rotate around a north axis any longer. 
And of course, the other thing that happens, it has always happened, is north to north, high income to high income country, migration continues, it's always been extremely robust, and not only because the European Union, of course, has free movement, but because in many different ways, rich countries find ways to allow and even encourage migration of um, you know, well-stilled or well, whatever, well-prepared people from other rich countries. They do it through a variety of ways. Even the United States that has one of the most inflexible, archaic, anachronistic immigration systems in the world today has found ways to actually welcome whoever wants to come in as long as they are from an equally developed country. The final point about an interesting new, relatively new development is, in a sense, a reversal of about 50 or 60 years of colonial migration. You know, um, one of the things that people like me, I know you guys are much smarter than I am, but I'm much older than you are. Um, we used to say as a refrain, you know, that if you really wanted to get a good sense of where people are likely to come from and where it is that they might go, is look at recent and not so recent history. Well, now we have to say the same thing, but think of it sort of like 180 degrees differently, which is formal, let me see if I can phrase this the right way, former colonial uh, um, uh, metropolises, and there are people returning to the colonies as, as it were because their former colonies are doing so much better than the metropolis now seems to be doing. And this is, you know, sort of an interesting development. So the question that I'd like to pose for all of us for the day and a half, <coughs> and the question that I struggle with is, have we reached a new normal? in terms of immigration, even if it is not as obvious as it might be, even if not the Eurostat data from, you know, the first quarter of 2012 or the U.S. labor statistics data, you know, from May, I guess, June rather, whatever it is, month, whatever month that we're in, doesn't exactly capture it. Uh, in other words, to put it even more provocatively, are we at an inflection point when it comes to how immigration behaves and it is likely to behave in the near to mid future? What do I mean that by that? The rest of this decade. And now I'm, I'm afraid that you'll say, well, you know, he asks a provocative question and then he sort of chickens out at the last minute. And I, for those of you who know me, uh, you will know that I don't chicken out at the last minute. But I will say that there is still all uncertainty. Uh, my instincts say, yes, there is a new normal. Yes, we have reached an inflection point. But whatever has remained of, my, of the scientist in me, of the sort of clinical observer in me, says, I'd like to wait for another year or so before I actually you know, issue a major pronouncement. Um, and the reason that we have to sort of say that in order to be um, fair about the whole thing is because of one thing that we do not know. Because I'm convinced that economic growth will not return to the levels that it was seven years ago. Certainly not in the next five or six or eight years. And I don't think that the chug chug of Germany is going to pull all of Europe with it. And I don't think that Austria's 4% unemployment somehow is going to become the new normal for anywhere else in Europe. And I think that there is nothing but economic troubles ahead. And I think that there is no way that we have devised a way of bringing, you know, together all of the people who need to be incorporated in a new lurch forward in the United States or in Europe to actually create a new massive economic growth machine. So, 
there I'm fairly comfortable. But what I do not know, and the reason that I want to wait another year or so, is how bad five years of bad economic views, high unemployment, high underemployment, might change in a significant and long-term way the behavior of a lot of, of, a lot of groups that exist in all of our societies. And I need to find some more evidence that indeed that behavior is changing. I don't know, for instance, whether the less educated, you know, will try harder to develop skills that will be more useful to employers and to their country. I do not know whether the disadvantaged and the marginalized are going to be targeted in a systematic way by countries that say that they need more workers. I, did not, I do not know that Europeans, and here I will be extremely provocative and I want to apologize for that, the Europeans who have gotten used to a really comfortable life let me repeat this, a really comfortable life, can actually realistically expect what had been promised to them in terms of retirement and health support systems, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will be there when they retire. I don't think that public finances can support the promises that were made in an entirely different era. You may disagree with that. We can wait another five years and find out you know, whether that's true or not. And I do not know whether in the few countries in Europe where women are still quite underemployed might find it more necessary to actually become more employed. And I have no idea. Actually, I will say something provocative again. This concept that people like you and me used to say, without thinking, it had become one of these, you know, completely unthinking refrain, which is that we don't want to do those undesirable jobs, whether it was the 3D of the Japanese or whatever else there is, whether the undesirable jobs of the mid-2000s are going to be undesirable and unwanted jobs in the mid-2010s, in other words, in 2015. And if all these behaviors change by a little bit, and that change is maintained, you know, in the next five or seven years, I think all these issues about demand, et cetera, et cetera, will have to be rethought. Minus one issue. Actually, two issues. We, I'm going to finish with those two issues. <laughs> Sorry. We are not going to get any younger. That's the number one issue. In other words, aging will continue, which means we will need people to pay into the social retirement systems, and we will need people that will need to take care of the much older country, much older people in the advanced industrial world. And that to me spells more immigration or somewhat more immigration even if all of those other adjustments take place. The second one is the hunt for talent. Um, the things that of course, Klaus talked about that we all, all of us have written about. In other words, the need for stilled migration will continue. It may accelerate. Let me assure you, Europe will never find a way to do the things that Klaus is actually talking about. It is not about policy. It has nothing to do with policy. It has to do with immigrants' choices. Still, the immigrants are not idiots. In fact, I have never come across an immigrant who is an idiot. Immigrants are at least as smart, probably smarter than we are. Of course, much harder worker, working than we are. And immigrants know where to go. And they go to places where they will be welcome, where societies have demonstrated that they are tolerant, 
where the barriers to entry, whether it is in terms of credentials, recognition, and proper treatment, etc., 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 you know, are obvious, and where they can get the fastest returns in the investments that they have made in their own human capital. That does not spell E-U-R-O-P-E. -E. Thank you. Thanks, Dimitri. He started saying he didn't know whether he would find something to disagree with Klaus, and I think he actually did pretty well in finding several topics of disagreement. Now, just to launch the debate, uh, we'll have about 15 minutes for question and then uh, for 10 minutes for question and then for the answer. The key words that Dimitri said were underemployment. Uh, he gave a figure of around 60 million of underemployed uh, people. These also raised the issue, which I think is very important, of informal market and informal employment, which we didn't mention, but again, is very linked, is closely linked to the migration and also to the flexibility to a certain an extent. Um, the second thing that he mentioned, which is very important, is the risk of losing an entire generation. Now, I'm an economist, and most economists will say that this continuity will cre create hysteresis. The idea is that if you have a shock like the crisis, for instance, it will be very, very difficult to recover the level of the past. He also mentioned, together with the youth uh, unemployment, the risk of extreme ideology. For instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there is a growing literature on the youth bulge and the conflicts, and that's a very important issue to uh, deal with. He mentioned South-South migration, he mentioned Southeast Asia, he mentioned that the direction are in all different places, and he says a provocative sentence, Europe or the US for the sake of it, uh, we think we are at the center, we are not so relevant after all. I saw a map which instead of having Europe at the center, a map of the world, had China at the center. And every single person that entered into my room when I had that map was noticing that. I think this is something that we should keep in mind. Now this is, uh, the risk I think connected to that is that we are becoming even less relevant if the BRIC plus, as he said, Indonesia, Mexico, are able to use the migration as an investment. So to see the important issues of migration and to use it as an investment to enhance growth. Uh, it mentioned that we are in a new structural breaking point and also connected to the south south migration. Just think of something. Portugal, it mentioned the colonial link. Portugal and Angola. Now all the foreign direct investment in Portugal, what is trying to take Portugal out of the crisis are foreign direct investment and migrants from, uh, sorry, uh, are foreign direct investment from Angola and there are a lot of Portuguese migrating now to Angola. So I think this leaves us a big room for discussion and uh, I will ask the floor whether there are questions. Thank you very much, uh, Klaus and, and Dimitri. In fact, I think rather than contradictory, in fact, these are two perspectives on the same issue, and policy is about reconciling uh, different uh, and conflicting objectives, and both objectives are, are legitimate. Uh, I happen to agree with uh, Klaus' Klaus' perspective, and I do not find anything that I could say to, to Dimitri, except uh, some observations. I think he did very well in emphasizing underemployment. Because in analyzing employment, uh, too often there is an emphasis on unemployment, and we know in developing countries, because if we talk about migration also, and migration for economic recovery, this is not a question only for uh, European countries or for North, uh, North America. So I think this is a very good emphasis to, to draw attention to uh, underemployment. Now, if you're pessimistic, uh, uh, pessimistic um, uh, analysis for the next five years, uh, uh, if they materialize, and you, you probably are right, I, I think there are good, there's a good chance for them to materialize. And if migrants 
uh, as you say, are very intelligent and they do not come to Europe. We have seen that in Mexico now they don't go. Uh, what will be the effects for the economic perspectives, the long-term economic prospects for Europe? So if migrants do not come at all, and uh, Klaus has told us that uh, highly skilled migration is necessary uh, to create uh, employment, uh, and if uh, you are in an aging uh, society, and you are right in everything you have said, then migrants will not come. What will that uh, produce as a consequence for the long-term uh, uh, economic recovery? And so what is the policy advice that you will give in this case to Europe? Will you give the same policy advice that Klaus has talked about? Or what would you do? I, I understand that there is a problem there, but uh, please help me understand how this could, could, could be sorted out. Uh, thank you very much, both Klaus and Dimitri, for their uh, wonderful presentations and uh, very informative. I have a very uh, specific question. Um, uh, I think Klaus mentioned for the medium term about the recognition of qualifications. Uh, Dimitri was saying, well, anything or, or everything that Klaus has there is a policy is impossible for Europe. I think I may quote you rather loosely. Uh, when I look at the uh, policy debate at the global level, for example, in the Global Forum on Migration and Development, I do see that the qualification of recognitions the portability of pensions and social security, not just within Europe, but I'm talking globally. These are, I think, not very controversial issues at the global level that indeed have huge potential gains, development gains uh, for migration. So my question uh, to both Klaus and Dimitri is, is, can you say a little bit more about whether that is something where we can move on globally with an initiative? and. And, and Demetrius, is it really very, is it impossible to achieve greater mutual recognition of skills, let's say, or indeed to promote uh, portability of rights and, 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 and pensions, healthcare, etc. Uh, for me, this is something that seems to be feasible, both policy-wise, has a huge payoff for development is this something that could be developed into something greater? But yes, there's a lot of nitty-gritty work to be done because it's really about bilateral recognition and what... what I, but I, I know also the EU is doing some work on that with third countries, Moldova, etc., etc. Is this an axis where we can move, uh, move on uh, in terms of benefits uh, and, and less controversial issues regarding global migration? Thank you. Thank you. I wish the chair had not stopped uh, Dimitrios in, its, in his tracks and uh, by handing him a slip of paper telling him you know, wrap it up because uh, he, uh, she got him off the hook. I wish uh, Dimitrios could tell us if it does not spell E-U-R-O-P-E, -E, what does it spell? Because that is the issue, you know, it's, 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 it's not us against them or anything like that. As a matter of fact, the European Union is trying. Uh, to deal with this issue as a homogeneous uh, policy uh, maker. But in order to develop a mig migration related policies, I think Klaus mentioned that, migration related, so a whole host of European initiatives, both domestic and international, we need the cooperation of the uh, countries of um, origin and transit, but mostly of origin. So there is nothing that we can do on our own, I think, in Europe, either nationally or internationally. If we do not persuade the countries of origin with the great, their great uh, demographic bulge and lower economic development perspectives, if we don't persuade them to cooperate with us, they have no incentive to do so for the moment because, like Italy, I'm Italian, like Italy a century ago, the more left Italy, the better it was for those who stayed and for those who left. So, I mean, there is uh, uh, an interest of countries of 
origin to let people go regardless of what they will find at their arrival. Now this has to be remedied as it was 100 years ago by ensuring that there is some kind of uh, intergovernmental agreements and those do not happen. So I would like our, our, our um, southern Mediterranean friends to elaborate on that also uh, uh, in the course of the next uh, uh, panels and, and uh, uh, days. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, to Klaus. Um, I really appreciate your analysis. Uh, you, your, your proposition to attract uh, high-skilled uh, workers uh, to European Union, but, uh, for example, Canada, Australia, United States, they also um, have a practice to attract high-skilled workers. So my question is the following. Why high-skilled workers have to stop to go to, for example, to the United States and they have to uh, choose uh, the European Union. Uh, so what are the competitive advantages of a European Union as a labor market for immigrants? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give the word to Klaus first and then to Dimitri to answer these questions and then the debate can go on also over coffee and then for two days basically. So very many interesting uh, questions, including the strong uh, statements of uh, Dimitri. Um, yes, I was, of course, in particular challenged uh, by Dimitri's position, uh, also reflected by some of the comments that Europe is unable, incapable to uh, make the necessary adjustments. Well, of course, Europeans are a bunch of uh, states which don't want to collaborate, really, yes. Uh, uh, also, they're on the way to collaboration. They don't want to collaborate, and it takes lots of time. But also, we have seen, and this is the advantage of the crisis, the crisis is not only that there was this big collapse and now we have unemployment. The crisis is also because policy makers haven't um, done the homework right in, in many ways. Let's say fiscal stability was not implemented in the agreements. We have not built enough European institutions. And Europe will bre break into pieces, very sure, if forced by the markets, if we, d we don't do the job. Not we, 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 we as citizens, and not as scientists, but if policymakers will not do the job. And I think it will also be, be with respect to mobility, I'm sure that uh, that the, the markets will force us, market forces also, uh, as soon as, as is it, when it becomes obvious that uh, Europe loses in comparison to the United States and Asia, uh, to open to open up here. And uh, so, so I'm not as pessimistic, so I, I'm not believing in strong governments as such, but I'm believing in markets forcing uh, governments, uh, at least in the long term. Now, if it comes to concrete issues, it's, well, okay, we cannot change languages overnight, for instance. I mean, uh, this, is, uh, this is hard, uh, I mean, uh, work. Maybe we should force um, uh, all universities to, in Europe to teach in English or something like that, yes? It could be French or Spanish, I'm, I don't care. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting German. However, I mean, English has the advantage that it, it's also spoken outside of Europe. So we have to, uh, we can go ahead in, 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 in with these kind of uh, issues and uh, proposals, but also uh, I think we should, and this was one of the questions here, the recognition of qualifications and the, uh, the, the possibility to take with you uh, pension schemes. This is so obvious, uh, acceptable, that, uh, that it should be possible to find general agreements, but with whom? The problem here is all these typical, I mean, within Europe, uh, well, if it comes to migration related issues, every, every Every state wants to be alone. Now, uh, beyond Europe, we have not, um, like in trade, uh, an international organization really taking care of uh, migration. I mean, 20 years ago, I was uh, once proposing.
promising to have something like a, a migration uh, uh, institution negotiating for more and more uh, uh, freer mobilities. Maybe we need, we have to call for that institution and, and to get, uh, get more, more progress uh, here. Now, um, uh, well, the, uh, one of the issues was here in the question, how can Europe uh, 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 be attractive. Now, I mean, uh, the, the first interesting thing is, is there is a debate about uh, universities um, uh, of the future, European universities, how to reform uni European universities, but it hasn't come very far. We, but we have to recognize that the world uh, human capital competition is dominated more and more by the Chinese American uh, 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 competition, so to speak, and there are smaller countries like Canada. Canada and Australia, New Zealand with long uh, open regimes. So um, what we have to offer is not a culture of welcome, uh, I, I agree, and we may never be able to do so, um, but uh, we, we have, uh, I think, we have a very strong tradition of universities, so I, I think, uh, very, and this is goes in line with, with what you said about Erasmus, we should, we should think of um, that uh, European uh, university policies could be in the center. Uh, of um, of uh, of that uh, that competition, and then that, there we have a lot to offer. I mean, we offer every, most of our places offer for free. Yes, uh, we should start with uh, with raising fees everywhere and uh, to use that money to invest. Uh, but that's already a very hot and uh, controversial uh, issue. At least in Germany, it's very hot. It's not so controversial in China, by the way. There, it's it's it's, it's understandable that you pay for your uh, higher education. So that this is always says something. So I think there are ways, ways out and these ways are not easy um, uh, but at the end of the day if we don't succeed we will economically lose very much and this will hurt us very much. Uh, either we, we move away all, uh, all of us to China or to the United States or we, we, we manage to reform Europe. I prefer the latter one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please Dimitri. All right. You can't have a debate without proposing a counter scenario. And that's what I'm proposing, a counter scenario. I think those of you who somehow think that this is a complete disagreement or anything more than a disagreement at some points, and mostly as a matter of emphasis with Klaus, I think you've, you, know, you haven't seen the point of proposing a counter scenario. Um, so, on Ibrahim's question, the proper counterfactual is not no migration. Nor did I say anything about no migration to Europe. When I said that the center of the world with regard to migration is not likely to be Europe, and perhaps not even the United States in the long, longer term. I did not say that immigrants will stop coming to Europe or to the United States. I simply said that not, we're not, immigrants are not gonna be as consumed about coming to the United States or Europe. Furthermore, I think that the United States and Europe will be much more selective in their immigration. And I can go further on this, or maybe we will as, you know, the conversation goes on. And so, you know, the idea what will Europe do with no immigrants is not on the table. I never suggested this. It's not even a matter of academic or, you know, just for the sake of argument, argument. Um, on your question, Bella, one of the, and here, you know, I, I've thought an awful lot about it. In fact, we're writing a number of papers on this. One of the most difficult things that uh, professional associations will allow to happen is to recognize credentials from other countries. There is an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of fraud on these credentials, and of course, Think of professional associations as, as the last but very important vestiges of protectionism. 
Everything else seems to be fall falling down, but not the protections that professional associations set up for themselves. And the reason that they set them up is very, very simple. They want to protect the privileges of their membership. And this, if we don't agree on that, then we cannot agree as to whether credential recognition is likely to happen in the short, medium, or longer term. I think in order for us to actually make real progress on credentials, we have to actually focus on qualifications rather than the final piece of paper. And I think we can make some progress on this, and there is some progress being made in a number of places. For instance, Australia has been doing you know, a very good job in trying to work through private companies to recognize or at least evaluate qualifications even before immigrants leave from wherever it is that they, that they are to come to, to come to Australia. You know, and that is promising. Canada is trying, but there is not much that has happened yet. Think of how difficult it is in Europe to recognize university degrees, you know, from some places throughout the rest of Europe. So I think that we're going to make some progress on that, not nearly as much progress as, um, you know, people like us and politicians actually say. I believe that it is important for the general pronouncements that bodies do, whether it is you know, the European Commission or parliaments, etc., etc., because they create a framework within which you, know, you can start working at this issue. And I think that if we manage to resolve some of the issue with qualifications, for instance, Quebec and France are near, near finishing an agreement where not only qualifications but actually credentials in one country are equal to credentials in another. A lawyer from France can go and practice law in Quebec and vice versa. But you realize both the impetus for that and, you know, sort of the irrelevancy of that. Tiny little Quebec, big France, and they're still negotiating these issues. So, you know, to show you how much agreement there is, the issue of portability of qualifications and portability of social security, you know, the kinds of things, is an essential feature of greater movement. And of course, that answers your question. That becomes an essential feature for increasing the payoff for development from migration. Um, the next question, if I understood it correctly, um, will country, sending countries cooperate with us on migration? Let me first say something about the fast rise in middle income countries. You know, I call them BRICS plus. These are not, this is not speculative. Turkey already has a very significant immigration intake. So is Mexico, so is most of Southeast Asia. This is not gazing into my whatever, you know, crystal ball. This is based on very, you know, sort of understanding and under knowing what is happening in each one of these countries in order to build that particular scenario. And when you look at the trajectory, the economic growth, et cetera, et cetera, of both of, of countries such as the ones that I've mentioned, you will see that they will become much more attractive to migrants and they will also go through a period where the argument within each one of those countries is going to be similar to the arguments that we had in the past 10 or so years. Do we really want to do these jobs? These are immigrant jobs or migrant jobs, you know. In other words, we don't want to do these jobs, let somebody else do them, etc., etc. And they will experience something similar to what we experienced, that very quickly they fill up with immigrants. And then they're going to go through the second debate or the second argument that we have also experienced, my God. How do we get to be, to get so many immigrants so quickly? Let me give you a case in point. Some of you may have read in the past 48 or 72 hours, uh, Ed Milbans, who is uh, the new labor leader. And I, I, I truly, truly recommend that you folks go and read his speech. 
there is such thing as too much exuberance about migration. I call it the irresponsible growth in migration. It, happens in South, it happened in Southern Europe, it happened in Ireland, it happened in the UK, it happened in the United States. The exuberance there was with illegal immigration. I think countries that don't build their immigration system slowly and carefully, that don't give them their institutions and their legal frameworks an opportunity to keep up with the changing climate and composition of their society and their labor markets pay a price. I'll put my 40 years of experience on the line against any experience that any of you may have on this. They pay a political price, they pay an orderliness price. And this, it's as if, as if these countries have somehow discovered the perfect antidote to economic cycles. There is no antidote to economic cycles, they happen. And when they happen and you go down, you can't get rid of seven million immigrants. You don't want to do it, your civil society won't allow you, the international world will not allow you. You're stuck with these people. So if you want to grow immigration, grow it at some sort of a legitimate orderly pace and have their institution, your institutions adapt to the change in circumstances. On the issue of intergovernmental uh, agreements, you know, I must say the only place that I hear this question is in some parts of Europe. You know, intergovernmental conversations, etc., etc. I come from a different school of thought. I will put it on the table. This is not speculative. This is not trying to, you know, to be provocative. Migration relationships work best when they're bilateral. At best, after you succeed bilaterally, you start thinking in a regional framework, something that Moises Naim calls minilateralism. Anything beyond that is for the next generation. In other words, it's going to take a long time for us to get to that point. And the next generation has a right to write its own history, of course. The is there a yeah, there is a fourth question. Um, I wanted to make my statement about Europe, whether it will be the chosen one in terms of steel migration, in very strong terms in order to demonstrate the point that, not that immigrants will not come, but if you want skilled immigrants and mid skilled immigrants whom you will need more than you will need high skilled immigrants, you will have to adjust how your people feel about immigration and how they behave toward immigration. End of story. If you disagree with this, fine. I see an awful lot of hands, of heads, you know, sort of shaking in approval of this. It's a very simple proposition. Governments and markets do not operate independently of societies. And we've had both operate independently of societies when it comes to migration in the past 10 or 15 years. Thank you.